there were all kinds of things, but I decided to just do it on LSD. And then they got a letter from um, the publisher of Chicken Soup for the Soul, uh, asking us to cease and desist. And the moral of that is that although the soul cannot be located, um, it can be copyrighted. <laughs> So, um, so that book then became uh, Psychedelic Trips for the Mind. And, um, and then I had all these other, a whole variety of, of, of stories that uh, most of them uh, were about magic mushrooms. But there were a lot about ecstasy and uh, uh, other uh, things that people ingest, uh, or, or smoke, or rub on, or rub in. And uh, uh, so originally I had thought that that would be called Magic mushrooms for the soul, um, and then uh, obviously it wouldn't. But since I had one for the the um, the soul and the mind, I thought it could be magic mushrooms for the body. But as I got into sorting out all the ones I had there, it, it ended up being magic mushrooms and other highs from toad slime to ecstasy. Um, there's a long piece I'll, uh, in there. One of the longest pieces, uh, uh, two of the longest pieces. I'll just read little little excerpts from. One is my piece about. Uh, Further weirdness with Terence McKenna, to whom to whom the book, um, and um, and then the other was a long piece, uh, uh, an ode to the toad, uh, and did, uh, by Ralph Metzner, uh, who was one of the original three musketeers at Millbrook, New York, with Tim Leary and Ram Dass, who was then Richard Alpert, and at first he was going to use a uh, pseudonym, Raoul Adamson. And uh, so, you know, if somebody wants to remain anonymous, that's fine with me. Um, um, and, but, um, and it was a very poetic piece, even Shakespearean, to, to describe Toad Slime, it was just amazing. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean, it sounded like, like, he called it the sacred toad. And so, um, uh, so at the last minute, I gave him the option of using, of using his own name and he decided to, to use it. So I was pleased by that because I thought that, that it, it gives it an extra dimension, knowing it was one of the, the original researchers with acid. And, um, I, um, th and the interesting thing was that um, I thought of him, because he's a very distinguished professor now, so I thought of him as a little boy, you know, with a straw hat and a uh, uh, piece of uh, weed, stick. I mean, you know, weed, regular old weed, sticking out of his mouth and a freckled face <laughs> with, a, with a tadpole in his pocket. And now he was growing up and he was a professor uh, wearing a pith helmet and glasses with a frog in his pocket. You know, he just, he just evolved along with it. So, um, um, this is the book um, which I published myself, the, uh, and I, which was a pleasure to do, even though it, uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, uh, I still owe money to the printer. Uh, but I could assign the artist to do the cover I wanted, which is um, designed after a 60s poster, and it has a magic mushroom here and a very stone frog sitting on top of it. Um, and you can see a little chunk has been bitten out of the mushroom. And uh, one of the contributors um, is uh, Todd uh, McCormick, who uh, worked with Peter McWilliams and uh, is serving five years in federal prison for growing medical marijuana. But he contributed a couple of stories to this. And uh, so I sent him his contributor's copy in a federal prison in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, the book was returned to me, and I just want to read you the, um, uh, the letter from the warden. Um, from the warden of the prison. Uh, at least he signed this. And he says, um, the, uh, um, the above named publication, uh, this book, is being rejected because on pages 259 to 261, it describes the process of squeezing toads to obtain illicit substances, which could be detrimental to the security, good order, and discipline of the institution. Uh, I had to read that a few times before I, I, I could believe it. Um, uh, and then, so they sent one to me and they sent one to Todd, who sent me this with his comment. says, I wonder how much we pay the guy or girl who actually sits and reads every book that, come, that comes in for the offending passages. Um, but, and I realized that, I, you know, I was 
kind of flattered. Wow, somebody read this whole thing here. <laughs> but then I realized, yeah, at least until page 259. Uh, but then I realized that, because um, there were so many things in here that um, um, the table of contents indicates uh, magic mushrooms, ecstasy, peyote, mescaline, THC, opium, DMT, ayahuasca, cocaine, belladonna, SDP, ketamine, PCP, cold slime, and others. Uh, and the and others contain things from drugs I hadn't heard of, like flagell, uh, to rug cleaner, to um, um, two TC2, has anybody heard of that? Uh, to Dramamine, um, uh, oh yeah, that's called the uh, sleeping pills, it will do it. Um, so, um, and I told somebody else about this and, and told me that um, there was a um, another book um, called Breaking Out of Jail, and it's a book teaching meditation to prison inmates. So breaking out, of course, is, is a metaphor, but uh, it, the Texas Department of Corrections uh, blocked the book from, from reaching the, uh, you know, obviously they didn't read it at all. But I think Todd was wrong that uh, it wasn't somebody who read the whole book. They just looked at the table of contents, turned to Toad Slime, and found that. And my theory was correct because um, when, when the, they returned the book, it, oh, you know, you could see it, it was kind of pristine, but it opened right to that page. So, um, uh, so the motivation really was not to prevent an insurrection, insurrection in, at the prison uh, of toads uh, being catapulted into, into over the over the fence, um, but it was to deprive him. It was to punish him for being in prison. Um, and um, so, I sent him another copy uh, with those three pages torn out. Uh, and with a note to the warden in it, so he would see. So it's like calling their bluff. Then, of course, they only open the books, they don't open letters, so I'll send them the three pages with a letter. So it uh, just defeated their own purpose. So, um, why don't I, I'll, I'll, let me start with uh, the dedication uh, to Terrence McKenna. It starts with a quote of his. Um, he was born in 1946, died in 2000. And this quote is If the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, don't include the right to experiment with your own consciousness, then the Declaration of Independence isn't worth the hemp it was written on. <laughs> um, magic Mushrooms is dedicated uh, to the memory of McKenna and his magic mind, one of the most vibrant minds I've ever encountered. And so it was with karmic irony that he died of brain cancer. He had a tumor which he described as, quote, the size of a snail egg, three inches behind his right eye. It had to be cut out immediately under local anesthetic. He was conscious during the entire operation. Guys, he joked with the doctors, let's keep the oops factor to a minimum here. Later, his son asked the, sur asked the surgeon, so this tumor, it's thinking? The doctor thought for a while and then he said, oh yes, it's thinking about something. Two weeks later, Terrence said that he kept, quote, looking into my mind to see what difference there was. Anti-muse, I'm trying to figure out what it was thinking about that I'm not thinking about anymore. So, that was a great, great little paradox to, uh, to start with. Um, all right, so I'll, let, let me start with um, um, some stuff from a piece called uh, Further Weirdness with Terence McKenna. This was, um, well, I, I'll give you the context, so, but I'll just read a couple of little sections from it. Um, the first thing you notice about the naked men and women soaking in the outdoor hot springs overlooking the Pacific Ocean is that they all seem to maintain excellent eye contact while engaging in casual conversation. Well, just like here, actually. Um, they have come to the Esalen Institute, a new age human potential resort in Big Sur, California, to, partic to participate in various weekend workshops. The group in this particular tub includes Terence McKenna, <clears throat> who will be conducting a workshop titled Pushing the Envelope. With his curly brown hair and beard, a twinkle in his eye, and a lilt to his voice, he could easily pass for a leprechaun. And, um, the, um, and then I go to what, what brought me to, to, to his workshop in the first place. A few months previously, on the morning of April 1st, I flew to San Francisco, where I had lived for 15 years. It remains my favorite city, and I jump at any excuse to return. 
My excuse for this visit, I was scheduled to MC a benefit for Beat Generation novelist Jack Kerouac's daughter Jan, who had been on dialysis treatment for the last few years. On that sunny afternoon, I was standing around stoned in Washington Square Park, wearing my mad magazine jacket that my daughter Holly had given me the previous Christmas. The smiling face of Alfred E. Newman, Newman stated his renowned philosophy, what, me worry, graced the back of my jacket. That's exactly how I felt that day, like a harmless innocent. I, had, I was waiting for the arrival of the annual St. Stupid Day Parade, led this year by Grand Marshal Ken Kesey and his merry prankster sidekick Ken Babs in an open-top convertible. The event was sponsored by the First Church of the Last Laugh. Their, their sound equipment was surrounded by yellow plastic tape warning, police line, do not cross. Somebody in a clown costume handed me a three-foot section of that tape, and April Fool that I am, I graciously accepted. Um, and it goes on and on. Um, and then after, after the benefit was over, uh, right before it, uh, that night at the benefit for Jan Kerouac, held, let's face it, only because she happened to be the daughter of a groundbreaking literary celebrity, even though he had abandoned her mother when she was pregnant with Jan, I pointed out that it, it's not enough anymore just to be a sperm donor. Backstage, someone I knew handed me a baggie of what I assumed to be marijuana. I thanked him and put it in my pocket. Ah, uh, yes, one of the perks of the benefit biz. Um, later, as the final members of the audience were straggling out of the theater, I was sitting with my friend Julius in his car in the parking area at Fort Mason Center. He was busy rolling a joint in a cigar box on the dashboard with the map light on. There was a police car circling around in the distance, but we foolishly ignored it. Suddenly, a moment later, there was a fist knocking heavily on the passenger side window and a flashlight shining in my eyes. Shit. Fuck. Caught. We were ordered outside and with our arms outstretched against the side of the car, searched. As I was being frisked, I realized that the cop was facing the back of my jacket with the face of Alfred E. Newman smiling at him and asking, what, me worry? And, and indeed, the cop was worried. He asked if I had anything sharp in my pocket. Because, he explained, I'm going to get very mad if I get stuck, obviously referring to a hypodermic needle. No, I said, there's only a pen in his pocket, gesturing toward the left uh, with my head, and keys in that one. He found the coiled up three feet of yellow plastic tape warning, police line, do not cross, and said, where'd you get this? I said, at the same stupid day, day parade. <laughs> What's it for, he said. I said, to keep people away. Uh, I tried to give him a concise answer. But then he found the baggie, and to my surprise, it contained psilocybin. He examined it, then reeking with sarcasm, he said, so you like mushrooms, huh? Under the circumstances it, circumstances, it was such a ridiculous question that I almost laughed, but I realized that from his point of view, this was a serious offense. Whereas Julius was given a $50 citation for possession of marijuana, I was arrested on the spot, handcuffed behind my back, and read my Miranda rights. I stood there, heart pounding fast and mouth terminally dry, trying to keep my balance on the cusp between reality and unreality. That cop's question, so you like mushrooms, huh? was asked with such archetypal hostility that it kept reverberating inside my head. So you like mushrooms, huh? It was not as though I had done anything which might harm another human being. This was simply an authority figure's need to control. But control what? My pleasure? Or was it deeper than that? To need to understand, this need to understand the basis of my plight became the impetus for my decision to meet Terence McKenna. He was, after all, the head mushroom guru. Uh, so I'll read a couple of things now from uh, the head mushroom in the world. Um, um, okay, so this is the beginning of the worship workshop. Uh, everybody, there were there were uh, 35 participants sitting on cushions in a circle against the walls of cabin in the woods. Everybody has arrived with their own personal agenda, and each will hear McKenna through their own individual filter. One by one, they introduce themselves. Here, a woman who is a professional raver. There, a man who strolled the streets of Paris with a lobster on a leash. Here, a mother and her son, whom she has brought as a gift for his 21st birthday. There, a woman who will spend the entire weekend sucking on a little straw coming out of the top of a plastic water bottle in the shape of a large pink erect penis. She introduces herself as a hooker from L.A. I'm here to party with the L's. <laughs> McKenna turns to the person next to her and says softly, Top that. <laughs> Someone tells him, I, hear, I heard you're one of the greatest minds in the universe. McKenna responds, more outlandish complaints. We'll compare notes at the end. 
If someone else publicly confides to him, if my life were a ride through the funhouse of Disneyland, you're like one of the characters who keeps popping up. McKenna confesses, I'm an epistemological cartoon. Um, when these formalities are over, he begins his rap, a swirling kaleidoscope of speculation on the influence of another dimension and what's happening at the end of the 20th century to fracture our understanding of reality. This weekend will turn out to be much more than I bargained for. Mushrooms are only a starting point. Why, McKenna asks, is there so much social tension over this psychedelic issue? Nobody who has informed themselves claims that great criminal fortunes are being made, or that kids are being turned into psilocybin runners in the ghetto. We know that all the stupid reasons given for suppressing psychedelics are in fact some kind of lie. And then the more naive on our side, therefore assume that, well, shortly some with reason will climb to its zenith, and all those things will be, la will be made legal. Not. Because this phenomenon is a dagger pointed at the heart of every social system that's ever been in place, from the grain power at Jericho to modern fascism in China. No social system is so confident of its first premise that it can tolerate this. But we don't live to the greater glory of social theories and institutions. We live because we find ourselves, as Heidegger said, thrown into being, and we have to sort that out on an individual basis. On an individual basis. And this is where McKenna's concept of novelty comes in. Novelty is the absolute core of his quest. The ultimate battle is between the increase of novelty as opposed to the habit or, ent uh, or entropy. Look at the history of the universe, he says. Novelty has been increasing since the Big Bang. We needed to undergo radical deprogramming before the eschaton, the last thing on Earth. Uh, so eschatology is the study of, of the end of the world. You, you, you've seen the PR people walking with those signs outside of Western the end of the world. <laughs> um, we are on the brink of moving into the domain of the imagination. Novelty is maximized and preserved. It changes our position in the cosmic drama, the cosmic accident. We're damn lucky to be here as spectators, we are told by science. Suddenly we matter. We still have the freedom to act, to create. The bottom line, the final message of psychedelics, the positive input that comes to you if you accept change is the message that the culture outside of psychedelics is so keen to deny with materialism everything from the calendar to the theories of democracy, but nothing lasts, not your friends, enemies, fortune, children, not even you, nothing lasts. Well, if you live your life in denial of that, then it's essentially like being dragged, kicking and screaming 60 years to the yawning grave. Strangely enough, the way you cheat the Grim Reaper by living as fast as you can is by living as fast as you can, because all time is the seriality of events. And the more events there are, the more time you have. So awareness becomes very important. And even as the Buddhists say, awareness of awareness. Uh, the first workshop I had taken there was with John Lilly, who, um, the more he worked with dolphins, the more he came to look like one. And his, his license plate was D-O-L-F-I-N. And, uh, and he wore a jumpsuit, and he would make these sounds, these clicking sounds that, 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 that um, uh, were made by dolphins. And so it was very uh, 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 strange to be in his company because uh, he, he wouldn't talk unless he pressed the right button. Um, and, uh, but he, had, he started off the workshop with um, a tape, a tape loop. It said the same word over and over again, again which was cogitate. And, but it played over and over again, but I began to hear other words, as did uh, the other participants. And I thought, cogitate, cogitate, then it seemed like to uh, morph into concentrate, concentrate, and then Sharon Tate, Sharon Tate. And, uh, but it, it turned out it was the same word the whole time, and, and his explanation was that uh, the mind, which he calls the human biocomputer, um, when faced with repetition, automatically programs in novelty. And um, so, so, so that was an explanation, and it was a metaphor for uh, um, what um, Terence McKenna was talking about, uh, where uh, novelty on, uh, is on a much grander scale. He's talking about novelties in history, not just in your own personal uh, biocomputer. So, so let, me, let me find that little section. And if, uh, again, if you have any uh, questions or comments, um, um, uh, just call out, um, um, what is that word, I mean, frop. Frop was a new word I today. What does frop mean again? Are you here? 
Frappe. That's right, that's right. That's what Bob Dobbs smokes is frappe. And so it became my new mantra because it's easy to remember. Um, the combination of, of uh, frappe, crap, and crop circles. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Uh, so he invented uh, this. Um, It was a, it, it's a, a timetable, a time frame from history recording all of the novelties. Novelty could be bad or good. So Nazi Germany was a novelty, uh, uh, the worst kind, as well as the positive ones. And he charted these and began to see cycles so that he could predict when other novelties would come along. He couldn't predict precisely what they were. And he kept saying, you know, I know this may sound mad to you, and if nothing else, take it as entertainment. And, which is why I liked him, because he wasn't dogmatic about it. He said, this is just what I'm doing, and, and you know, if, if you're here for the ride, enjoy it. But he, but he wasn't dogmatic, and he took it from a scientist's point of view, which is to look for mistakes, to try to disprove your own theories, rather than, than dogmatism. Um, so let's see where this part is. Any questions yet? Um, when do you hand out the mushrooms? Excuse me? <laughs> when do you hand out the mushrooms? Oh, there's, there's, you'll find some cow shit in the path there. Just help yourself. <laughs> uh, the, um, okay, here it is. Um, now he's talking about... Um, here, here, here he's saying better than, than I can say it. Uh, I basically function as the nutty professor. And he says his words... He separates when there are two teeth together. Nutty. He says nutty, like you see in the dictionary with a little dot between between the syllables. And he talks like that with an Irish lilt. He said, you know, uh, things are getting nuttier and nuttier and nuttier. That, that was my mantra for a long time. And I was to, to things are getting frappier and frappier and frappier. Um, he, he says I basically function as the nutty professor. This is so personal that no one has ever tried to steal it. That's how uniquely and wholly and totally mine it is. So if it's malarkey, I get all the blame, and if it's true, I get all the credit. On a basic level, the cosmology that I'm proposing is this, that the universe should be thought of as a kind of struggle or competition between two enormous forces. We'll name them habit and novelty. Habit is repetition of the pattern already established. It's conservation of traditional values. It's a path of least resistance. It's momentum. Novelty is an equally easy concept to grasp. Novelty is what's never been before. Novelty is emergent. Novelty is new. Novelty makes connections where they were never made before. And in fact, before, earlier this afternoon, uh, there was a woman, Jill, who was, uh, had a hula hoop, and she was doing it. And her daughter was climbing underneath the hoop, so at a certain time, she could uh, uh, get up without disturbing the motion. And, and, and immediately I thought, there's novelty in action. Uh, and I was curious, you know, was this already a trend? Uh, um, uh, but they had just invented it on the spot there. And so it, it, was, it was pure novelty. Although, you know, and then novelty gets co-opted. So I'm sure there's going to be Frisbee events in the Olympics uh, sooner or later uh, as it develops. And for the first time, they'll allow do dogs to be in the Olympics. <laughs> Chase them. Um, so he says, uh, any span of time, a millisecond, a million years, has within it a struggle between habit and novelty, and potentially a signature of how that process proceeded, like a stock market. The shifts between habit and novelty are like the shifts between highs and, and high and low prices of commodity. The good news in all of this is that novelty is winning, and novelty will triumph absolutely at a certain future moment in time. Let me lead us into the future here. All mysteries will be revealed. Um, okay, and now the thing is that, uh, um, and he predicted that uh, es the eschaton would be in um, December, well, December 21st uh, in the year 12, 1220. Uh, 2020, I'm 2020, 2012, 2012, right. And, and this was the same, uh, he learned, as uh, the Mayan calendar. And uh, so that was, you know, that will stretch one's bounds of boundaries of coincidence. Uh, 
and, and it also, uh, you know, kind of validated uh, his, um, his own theory. Um, and so the group gathers in front of a computer, and then McKenna takes us on a guided tour of novelty and history. Um, he's, this is all quote now. We're now at six million years, and this is the story of the evolution of the higher primates. And these are solar energy cycles, gla glaciations. We're still moving in the realm here of large-scale cosmic input. This is a domain of high novelty, a very long period, longer than the time that separates us from Moses. This may be where that partnership paradise occurs, the early influence of psychoactive plants on consciousness. Now we're under a million years. And remember, it wouldn't have any of these correlations if the end date were different. Uh, this is the last 62,000 years, 42,000 years. This is the mushroom paradise back here. The crucifixion is here. This is the fall of Rome here. And as he's saying this, you can see uh, on the computer scrolling and, and this kind of graph going up and down. Uh, and it was in reverse. When there's novelty, it goes way down rather than up for some explanation that I didn't understand. Um, um, this is the birth of Muhammad here. This is the consolidation of Islam, year 507 to 630, Muhammad's birth and death. The world had never seen anything like Islam. These guys were desert tribes dealing water to each other for millennia at the edge of organized civilization. They were desert barbarians, and suddenly one guy, Muhammad, not only founds a world religion, but claims the allegiance of 700 million people. We have to get those evil guys, huh? Uh, and, and he founds a political order, too. Buddha didn't pull that off, and neither did Christ. There's a book, The 100, that seeks to list the 100 most influential people in human history. And number one, Muhammad, built a political and religious and philosophical order that maintained its, co its coherency. Uh, however, uh, as I said before, however, novelty is not necessarily a good thing from the human point of view. Uh, McKenna asks, what happened in 1355? Within 18 months, one third of the population of Earth died. Bubonic plague, and no one knows how many died in Europe. It's an interesting signature. It certainly is novel to have one third of the population drop dead, uh, unquote. Because McKenna's predictions of the past are in accurate accordance with history, he is able to extrapolate into the future. Quote, I predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, Tiananmen Square, Chernobyl, Chernobyl, I predicted all of these things. I didn't say what would happen, but I said the day, this day will be the most novel day of the year. The journey through time continues. Quote, this is 1440, Gutenberg invents printing. 1492, Columbus. The American Revolution begins at a symmetry break, at the top of a slide into novelty. It succeeds. The French Revolution begins at the bottom of a novelty. Trow, trow, trow on an upturn into habit and fails. January 1st, 1900, symmetry break occurs. And this is the signature of the 20th century, an almost continuous descent. Ascent in a sense, but depicted in this computerized graph as, a, as descent. Into novelty from 1900 to 1905. The special theory of relativity, 1906. Flight, radio, World War I, the Russian Revolution. Dada, surrealism. It's the 20th century for crying out loud. Hitler, big time novelty. World War II culminates with the atomic bomb, the end of the war and the return to normalcy. 1950, invention of the hydrogen bomb. For those of you who are true fans of predictive accuracy, the day of the human being, January 13th, 1967, is the day we go over the hump. Isn't it wonderful that it validates? Well, but hell, it was the symmetry breaking moment. And then just after that, the landing on the moon and the cascading to novelty. Saddam invades Kuwait. Tiananmen Square, three million, the largest crowd in human history. We're right about here. This is the pause before the storm. This is the most habituated moment that we will know for maybe the rest of time. Boy, was I exhausted. Uh, talk about your long, this is me talking now, not him. Talk about your long, strange trip. Maybe it's all really just self-fulfilling prophecy, but you have to admire McKenna, if for nothing else, for just how far out on a limb he is willing to go. Hell, he says, I live on a limb. Um, so before I go on to the next piece, just let me cut to the end of this, uh, which is the other shoe dropping, muddy as it is, um, for, um, um, for, for why I went there in, in the first place. Um, Jan Kerouac had, had met her father only twice. The first time she was nine. The second time, six years later, he sat drinking a fifth of whiskey and watching the Beverly Hillbillies. Jan died of kidney failure at the age of 44 never having fulfilled her fantasy of becoming drinking buddies with her father, who died when she was a teenager. As for my psilocybin bust, I was lucky. 
With the aid of a, with the aid of a terrific attorney, Doran Weinberg, I go out, got off with a hundred dollar fine and nothing on my permanent record. Uh, but I finally understood what the cop had meant when he snarled. So you like mushrooms, huh? What was his actual message? Back through eons of ancestors, all the way back to those unstoned apes, this cop was continuing a never-ending attempt to maintain the status quo. He had un unintentionally re revealed the true nature of the threat he perceived. What he had really said to me was, so you like the evolution of human consciousness, huh? Uh, well, uh, well, yeah, now that you mention it, I do. I mean, when you put it like that, so you like the evolution of human consciousness, huh? Sure I do. I like it a whole lot. So, um, that's what I learned from that one. Um, thank you. Now, I'll read a little bit now from a, a piece by, uh, I want to get enough variety here. So, um, this is a little piece by um, Roz Payne, who is the president of the uh, Mushroom Society, of, Mushroom Club of Vermont. And they have their national meetings every year. They have one at the Telluride, the Telluride Mushroom Festival, and she's one about the three of them. She's just an expert on mushrooms. Um, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of, of her expertise and then get to her, uh, her trip. Um, she, um, cause they use, cause they, 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 they use them in, in uh, meals. Uh, um, Um, no, this is she's describing the, the, the Telluride Festival here. Um, okay, but here, I'll give you an example of, of what they did at the Ver Vermont Mycology Club. It was the ad that ran in, a, in the events of our local newspaper she read. On a warm day in May, 20 people showed up at my house bearing, bearing various mushroom dishes, including were creamed morels in baked puff pastry, bolivis edulis, porcini pizza, Cream of 18 mushroom soup, pickled honey mushrooms, clumps of oyster mushrooms cooked in olive oil and butter, hedgehog tooth mushroom salad, chanterelle omelette, amanita caesara on toast, maras miss mias toasted with pine nuts, agaric is fried with chicken, puffball lasagna, juice, espresso coffee, wine, and beer. And um, so, but, but here she goes to, to, to this conference, and uh, she says, one year we gathered in the evening after a lecture in a suite of rooms at a condo on the first anniversary of the death of Jerry Garcia. Someone from Ben and Jerry's had donated pints of Cherry Garcia ice cream, and someone from the evergreen area of Oregon had brought a hot fudge sauce. It was delicious. We ate and ate, talked and talked. At some point, I realized that someone was talking, and no words were coming out of his mouth. And his spine began to melt. <laughs> it turned out that the hot fudge sauce had bits of chopped up psychoactive mushrooms in it, and I had overeaten. <laughs> my, my, my friend, uh, and I can understand that because I, I, I don't uh, uh, drink liquor, but um, uh, I... Um, was at, uh, spent the Christmas at Ken Kesey's family's house in, in, in Eugene, and um, Ken's brother Chuck runs a creamery there. They put out Nancy's yogurt, a lot of products, and he brought over ice cream, which had two kinds of liqueur in it. And because of the coldness and sweetness of the ice cream, you couldn't really taste the alcohol. And so I overate the ice cream, and I vomited and passed out and got drunk for the first time in my life. And, uh, I just wasn't used to taking legal drugs. Not the proper set and setting for that. Um, so uh, she says uh, that she had overeaten uh, the, the fudge sauce with the psychoactive mushroom. Food. She said, my friend from Ben and Jerry's had left, and I was alone with a room full of people. Someone said, I know why he left. He left because our ice cream is better than his. Um, obviously a case of ego loss. Um, I wanted to leave, she says, but did not know how to. I opened the door of the condo and looked down the long white hall with too many doors. I had no idea how to get to the street or which way was up and which way was down. I closed the door. People wanted to talk to me. I didn't want to talk. I just wanted to go home to my little room at the Oak Street Inn at the other end of the same street. I kept asking folks if they would walk me out of the building so I get to the street where I thought I would be able to walk home. After what seemed like a long time, two sisters, meaning two siblings, not two nuns, um, um, 
who were leaving to walk their father back home, they agreed to help me. I followed them through a maze and falls down a set of stairs to the outside of the condo. Once outside, I found myself inside a fractal. I was in the, I was in the midst of various color beams of light crystals which shot down from the heavens and surrounded me. I had no idea how to walk, and the street was gone. Uh, um, one of the sisters took my arm, and so they, they, they got her down, um, and um, she said, about a block from my room, I must have been making sounds of gagging, and I heard a sister say, it's okay, just throw up. I had no idea I was feeling bad, but I threw up at the curb and felt much better. Um, there's a, um, um, as I edited this book, I realized how uh, uh, wretched became one of the themes running through it. There were a lot of descriptions of vomiting. In fact, one of the quotes I have uh, at, the, at the beginning is, um, uh, I have three, three quotes. Um, one is um, from uh, the Dutch Health Inspection Service, quote, psychedelic mushrooms don't pose a risk to public health and should be made legal. So if anybody wants to move to Amsterdam, get your pa uh, passport ready. The next quote comes from Ethan Nadelman, head of the Drug Policy Alliance. No one should be punished for what they put into their bodies. And this third quote comes from uh, not the Michael Jackson, who's the singer and uh, child molester. Um, but, uh, this is a radio talk show host named Michael Jackson. Uh, and he said, anything that can make vomit pretty is certainly worth taking. <laughs> And he's a Brit, so you can imagine saying anything worth, you know, it was very inspiring. Um, and I mean, I'm sure many of us have been there, looking at our own vomit, just amazed and, and grateful for this multicolored mosaic moving around, just for us. Um, all right, so Roz continues um, saying, um, um, my hiking boots were tied with a double knot. I, un I tried to untie a boot, but could not understand how a knot worked. As I pulled at it, one of the sisters said, it's okay, I'll do it. I said, no, just cut it off. <laughs> but she untied my boots and asked if there's anything else I wanted or needed before she left. I thanked her and said good night. Finally alone with my door locked, I was safe in my room. I put on my long white cotton nightgown, laid back on the bed and looked around. My safe harbor turned out to be an ugly small room with whitish yellowed walls of a smooth lumpy stucco type of material. I had never really looked at the walls before. The walls were breathing, each pore slowly moving and pulsating. I began to see the walls for the first time amazingly, amazingly clear, so beautiful. Native American patterns began to merge with East Indian dancers who had appeared and they melted into each other. I watched for a while until I decided that I needed to capture the beauty. I took out my Sony mini digital video camera and began to shoot the living, breathing wall. My history of documentary filmmaking took over. She was with a group called Newsreel, which uh, um, in the 60s and 70s, you've heard of Newsreel? They did a lot of progressive uh, um, uh, documentaries uh, of political demonstrations and uh, uh, anything countercultural and, and uh, edited themselves and and showed her that various events, but it was, um, you know, in, uh, uh, the precursor of, of some of the documentarians uh, now, but they were just a kind of uh, a, 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 commune, a commune of document, of, of video documentarians. Um, that, um, the, it was important to capture what I was seeing. The evening was long and I wanted to remember by recording all that I saw. As I shot the wall and panned to the right, I captured my reflection in a mirror, me in my long white gout nightgown, how, holding my video camera. I began to talk quietly, describing what I was seeing. I videoed the wall so I would remember. It was late, I was tired, and I turned off the video camera and the lights. I lay down on the bed listening to the sound of the bars closing on Main Street, the drunks in the alley, and the workers throwing out the trash as I retreated into mushroom dreams and finally slept, feeling safe knowing that I had the mini digital video of my mind. Later, when I returned home and showed the tape to my friends, we all laughed at my footage of blank stucco walls. <laughs> so even if you're a, 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 an expert on something, you, you know you can still uh, um, turn into into uh, a, 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 fool, a fool in the best sense of the word. Uh, okay, here's one one last little. I'll read, this is a short little piece. I'll read the whole thing on uh, on mushroom and I'll get to some of the others. This is by a guy named Tom. Uh, Obviously, um, um, 
he wants to remain anonymous. So a bunch of us headed down to Charlotte for the October 5th, 1984 Grateful Dead show. In the early 80s, most venues did general admission, so if you got there early enough, a few hours was usually plenty in those days, you could get the seat you wanted. We always liked the rail end seats on stage left. In any arena, these seats were usually just above stage level and afforded you a great view of the stage, the guitar players facing you. Anyway, we got inside and got our front row on the side railing seats, and everything was great. First set was really good, and then the break. We had all gotten fungicized, so when the lights came up, it was a bit nerve-wracking, but we settled down and got into the break and were talking about how glad we were that we weren't on the floor because it looked so crowded. All of a sudden, about 20 feet in front of the stage, a circle starts to open up. We assume that someone has thrown up, there it is again, uh, <laughs> or some such thing, so he leaves the door open. Uh, but as the circle gets bigger, we see that it's a guy on his knees with his pants pulled down around his ankles, jerking off with the biggest smile on his face he'd ever seen. And this was before uh, they knew that uh, masturbation could uh, prevent prostate cancer. So this guy was doing it for its own sake. You know, not, it wasn't goal-oriented masturbation. <laughs> Well, that was for a, a more immediate goal than preventing prostate cancer. The control group. What? The control group. The control group, right. You, you guys just keep, and then when you near climax, stop. And you guys just go right ahead. Um, so, he was obviously re really tripped out and having a blissful time masturbating in front of 13,000 people. None of us can boast of that. Uh, this was very hard to handle in our condition. We basically had a front row seat for this, and it was very weird. Uh, by this time, the circle is 50 feet in diameter because no one's, one wants to go near this guy. He just continues on with his business. A girl I knew <laughs> standing next to me says, why doesn't someone go out and help him? <laughs> So, you know, I mean, may, maybe altruism is wired into our genetic structure. And he, be my guest, I said. I have no idea if he even realized where he was. The cops are laughing and won't go near him. When he finally shoots his wad to great applause, and someone throws him a bandana, and he starts wiping up the floor. The cops then go out and get him and gently cart him off to who knows where, but he never stops smiling. We're going to get a jury of his peers. <laughs> okay. All right, this is a piece by a hung jury, a well hung jury. <laughs> um, all right, this is a, a called a son, son of. Now we're into uh, a, another drug. Uh, this is called Son of a Beetle by uh, Sadie Leon, which I happen to know is not her real name because she's my niece. Um, hey, great hair, Sean Ooze, Ooze uh, stumbling over me at this big Hollywood party. I'm Sadie, I say, extending my hand. His eyes widen with a wave of ecstasy. You know, he says, there's a Beatles song with your name, Sexy Sadie. Yeah, I know, I say, completely composed. I was named after it. I had to lie, there was no choice. My dad wrote that song, he says. That means I'm like your uncle. With every step, he takes a step closer to me as though he is examining every fine detail of my face, like he doesn't believe that I am actually a person. Funny, I'm thinking the same thing. Right on, I say. As I turn to greet another great rock legend's son, after all, I have to work the room, I hear Sean Lennon's voice asking, Can I buy you another pill? My turn away suddenly becomes a turn back. Sure, I guess, shrugging my shoulders, attempting to ignore the voice in my head shrieking, It's John Lennon's son! It's John Lennon's son! I shyly venture toward the stash. My friend Becca is providing the entertainment pills for the evening, so scoring this added fun, to add it, scoring this added fun is no issue. They're $30 a piece, but totally worth it. Another lie. They're really 20 and worth that, but Becca has to make the rent. Okay, Sean says, but you have to hang out with me, which gives me that too much cheap vodka in my stomach sensation. I hesitate, but since I'm on a bed filled with my dearest friends, there appears to be no harm. After all, it's John Lennon's son. Sure, I say, you can hang out with all of us using a typical girl safety net. 
20 minutes later, eight of us are piled upon a twin-sized bed. I'm sitting there, randomly shaking my head like a wet dog, trying to convince, convince myself, no, I am not in love with Sean Lennon, and no, he is not in love with me. It's just the drugs. It's just the drugs. Sadie, he salivates. I've never met a Sadie before. I bet your parents were a lot like mine. Somehow I doubt it. Uh, what are you doing tomorrow, he asks. Oh, no, don't ask me that. Never make plans with anybody for the next day while you're still on a high. They tend to be overzealous, and no one is as exciting in daylight as they were the night before. I have to work, I said. Oh, shit, tomorrow is the 4th of July. Oh, he says, you want to call in sick and go to Paris? We can get tickets on the Concorde and stay at the Ritz. See what I mean by overly zealous? <laughs> it's now 7.30 a.m., and all I want to do tomorrow, or rather today, is take a bath and go to bed. A plane ride is not on my agenda, even on the Concorde. Yeah, she says, but what else are we talking about? I just want a lot of cuddles, he says. No Concord trip is worth that. Besides, the voice screaming is John Lennon's son has subsided hours ago. I'll see you later, I say, walking to my car. But wait, goddess of the night, I don't even have your number. As he runs after me, I catch a glimpse of that little boy the world had known years before, but only through photographs. It is almost enough to make me re reconsider. You don't need my phone number, I reply, shutting the door. I drive home, lock my door behind me, and take a hot bath. It isn't the Ritz, but it is home in America. And uh, so, uh, that's good. She wasn't uh, a celebrity fucker or, or, uh, or a son of a celebrity fucker. Um, do I? Uh, well, who knows, you know, I mean, um, uh, just because He's the product of, of, of John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Ono uh, doesn't mean that he's not capable of being an asshole. Uh, and and um, uh, she had now she had a sentence in, it, in this, and, and I didn't want to be a censor. Um, but I said, look, I, I'm not going to censor what you wrote, but I just want you to know um, that Yoko is a friend of mine. You can write anything you want, but I just want you to know that. So she took out on her own one sentence, uh, which wasn't here, which was when he says. Uh, I'll, I'll bet you just like your parents are just like mine. Uh, she went to the uh, right. Um, I felt like saying to him, "No, my my mother never broke up the Beatles." <laughs> so, so she had she had the, the, the sense of appropriateness to take that out, which, which I felt better about. Um, in fact, let me go. Let me switch now to to uh, uh, my trip with with Lennon and Yoko. Um, I'll jump around now. Um, um, yeah, this is, I'll, I'll read the whole, the whole thing. It's called Smoke Lennon. Uh, and uh, it's by me. Uh, I use my, my, my pseudonym, which is Rumpel Forskin. <laughs> Actually, that was the name I, 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 I use my real name here, but when I had a radio show in San Francisco, uh, it was a call-in show, and so I told them I would do it if I could call myself Rumpel Forskin. And, and so uh, they agreed. And so people, people would call in very angry about something, and it would defuse their anger. But, Let me speak to a Rumpel Forskin. <laughs> so I, I tried to get them listed in the San Francisco uh, uh, phone book, and. They wouldn't let me do it. They said, we can list you as foreskin rumple. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not quite the same. Uh, um, so I, I, I gave up on that. Um, okay. Um, I remember a moment of epiphany at Shea Stadium in 1964 while the Beatles were singing. Even though I couldn't hear them above the screaming of the crowd, it had to do with the way that members of the audience could identify with each Beatle in a personal way. This was summed up by a young girl holding aloft a hand-lettered poster that said, It's all right, John, I wear glasses too. Uh, during the following years, the Beatles took us along on their musical journey from youthful innocence to psychedelic awareness, from I want to hold your hand to I want to get, I want to turn you on. The unofficial credo of the burgeoning counterculture became, take a sad song and make it better. I first met John Lennon with Yoko Ono in July 1972. When I asked him a naive question, was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds about LSD? He, died, he denied it with the wink of a dedicated prankster, just as Peter Yarrow had denied the Peter, Paul, and Mary song, Puff the Magic Dragon, with that line in the lyrics, Little Jackie Papers, was about pot smoking. My friend comedy writer Donna Kaufman had been keeper of the marijuana for George Harrison, and he tried to teach her how to roll a joint with one paper. She preferred the two-paper method. 
quote, which George found amusingly amateurish, she told me. So I would hand the stash to him and he'd roll these single zigzag bombers. Such a talented man. <laughs> John and Yoko spent a weekend at my home in Watsonville, California. It's right near Santa Cruz. They loved being so close to the ocean. In the afternoon, I asked them to please smoke their cigarettes outside. But in the evening, we smoked a combination of opium and marijuana, sitting on pillows in front of the fireplace, sipping tea and munching cookies. We talked about conspiracy researcher, researcher Mae Russell's theory that the deaths of leading edge musicians like Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Otis Redding, and Jim Morrison were actually political assassinations because they served as role models, surfing on the crest of the youth rebellion. No, no, Lennon argued, they were already headed in a self-destructive direction. A few months later, though, he would remind me of that conversation, adding, listen, if anything happens to Yoko, Yoko and me, it was not an accident, unquote. Um, such was the level of his understandable paranoia. After all, the Nixon administration had been trying to deport him, ostensibly for an old marijuana bust on another continent, but actually because they were afraid he was planning to perform for protesters at the Republican counterculture convention in Miami that time, which would have been brought in thousands of younger people. Indeed, in April, J. Edgar Hoover had directed the New York office of the FBI to, quote, locate subject Lennon and remain aware of his activities and movements. Careful attention should be given reports that the subject is heavy narcotics user, unquote. Ironically, Elvis Presley, who originally had such a profound influence on the Beatles, was totally stoned when he visited the White House, received a federal narcotics officer's badge from Richard Nixon himself, and then warned the president about the danger posed by the, posed by the Beatles. Uh, and Joan Bennett, uh, Joan Baez. Um, anyway, under the mellow cloud of opium, we also discussed the Charles Ma Manson case, which I had been investigating. Lennon was bemused by the way Manson had associated his own dreams of chaos with Beatles music. Look, John said, would you kindly inform Manson that it was Paul McCartney who wrote Helter Skelter, not me. Uh, Yoko interrupted, no, please don't tell him, she said. We don't want to have any communication with Manson. It's all right, Lennon said. He doesn't have to know the message came from us. It's getting chilly in here, Yoko said to me. Would you put another cookie in the fireplace? <laughs> Lennon was absentmindedly absent holding on to the opium doobie. I asked him, do the British use that expression to bogart a joint, or is that only an American term, you know, derived from the image of a cigarette dangling from Humphrey Bogart's lower lip? In England, Lennon replied, with that inimitable sly expression on his face, if you remind somebody else to pass a joint, you lose your own turn. <laughs> now, he, now he had, a, as I say, a very sly sense of humor, and, and years later I realized he might have been putting me on totally. <laughs> Is there anybody from England here who, um, um, Matthew, are you here? From Wales? Is that a, is that a custom? there? No. Yeah, so he was putting me on. Uh, and I believed it. Um, um, on the other hand, at, uh, at a cannabis cup in Amsterdam, I was sitting next to uh, Rita Marley, the widow of Barb Marley, and uh, she had a huge joint, almost the size of a, of a cigar with a goiter. <laughs> and she was smoking it there and smoking it there, and um, um, I was waiting for her to pass it, and she got smoking away and smoking away. And somebody passed me one from the other direction, and I said, thank you. And then she explained to me, uh, in Jamaica, uh, uh, we, we don't pass our joints around. And I don't, I don't know if now she was putting me on. Does anybody here from Jamaica? Yes. It is true. Uh -huh. uh, and what's the, what's the reason for it? They have so much, each one has their own? Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't like to get sick from each other's germs. Ah, uh-huh. And they Okay, so Lennon was putting me on, but Rita Marley wasn't. Okay, good. It's, it, you need a program to tell the time you put on it. Um, and I'm a professional prankster, so uh, uh, I'm easy to do. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, any, any, um, uh, let's see. Okay, the Reverend Ivan Stang is here, so I'll, I'll read his other piece. Um, it's um, and, uh, it's a nice short one, so I'll read the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Buried Spider by Ivan Stan. It happened to me when I was four years old. Absolutely vivid hallucinations, totally indistinguishable from reality, like in a nightmare on Elm Street movie. Yes, some druggist there in Fort Worth filled the prescription wrong, 
And for the flu, I got a double adult dose of Belladonna. I woke up in the morning watching a parade of animals of every kind wandering peacefully around the house, just like Noah's Ark. I chased these monkeys that kept disappearing. I recall all of this part as it happened yesterday, although I can't recall what did happen yesterday. What I don't remember is the spiders. My mom said she realized that I wasn't pretending, but that I was crazed when I huddled in the corner and screamed about the spiders. Brr, scary to think that's buried in my subconscious somewhere. Um, and let's see, here's another short little piece by Robert Anton Wilson, I'm sure some of you know his work, um, called Holiday Trip. Um, my first experience with a major psychedelic was with peyote in 1962, and that was full of marvelous philosophical revelations, beautiful colors, magnificent visions, and at the height of it, this was New Year's in 1962, I went into the other room and looked at the Christmas tree and the ornaments, and everything was beautiful. It was the most beautiful Christmas tree I ever saw. And then I realized that the Christmas tree loved me, and I burst into tears. I was running back to tell my wife and my friends, the Christmas tree loves me. Even telling that story now, tears come to my eyes. I remember the experience so vividly, the Christmas tree that loves me. Um, Oh, here, I'll, I'll select one from, from, from the and others section uh, here. Uh, here's another little short one on uh, Morning Glory Seeds uh, by Rex Weiner, um, who used to be, the, a long time ago, was the editor of, of an underground paper in New York called The New York Ace, in case anybody remembers it. Um, when I was 15, the word was you could get high from eating Morning Glory Seeds. So one fine morning, I went to the garden store and bought 10 packets. At home, I sat down in the kitchen and poured them into a bowl. They were hard, polygonal, little black things. I tried chewing one, and it nearly broke my tooth. I tried to mash a handful with my mom's rolling pin. Remember rolling pins? Did they still have them, I guess? I just remember from an old comic strip, Maggie and Jigs, and it used to be a rolling pin that she would always be chasing him. I don't think she ever made a cake. She just would chase, <laughs> chase him with the rolling pin. That, another function. Um, uh, my, I'm trying to mash a handful with my mom's rolling pin, but at that moment she came home. So I hurriedly poured all the seeds into my pocket and got busy making myself a salami sandwich. When my mom walked in, that's all I was doing, making myself some lunch before going outside to play. In the woods nearby, I sat down with eager anticipation of a psychedelic afternoon in, in the midst of glorious nature. I poured the seeds out of my pocket and tried pounding them with a rock, intending to take the powder and eat it. But they just sort of splintered when I hit them. They pissed me off, those little black seeds, <laughs> and I was impatient to get high. So I took out my salami sandwich, pulled open the bread, and piled on the seeds. A lot of them fell out, but the mustard held most of them very nicely. <laughs> I consumed the sandwich and was picking the little black bunkers out of my teeth for about 15 minutes, when suddenly a stabbing pain seared my gut like a blowtorch, and I keeled over, puking, there it is again. <laughs> I should have made a tally sheet. Uh, puking furiously. I, yeah, nobody pukes smoothly. Man. I was sure I was going to die. When I looked down, my puke was in technicolor. Right, nobody pukes in black and white either. For the next, uh, unless they're watching an old movie. Uh, for the next five hours, I was flat on my back, hallucinating like crazy. And I just hung on for the ride until I could finally walk home. But forever afterward, I could not eat salami or mustard or even think of them without feeling queasy. And the sight of anything small, black and seed-like made me sick to my stomach. Even now, a dotted line on a piece of paper, even thinking about it more than 30 years later. Um, let's see, I should... Um, Rex, by the way, I knew... Um, um, we were both... I was the head writer on an HBO show, and he was one of the other writers in 1980 about the... Uh, presidential election when Ronald Reagan ran against, um, uh, who did he run against? I don't even remember. Carter. Jimmy Carter, right, and, and, and another one, John Anderson. It was three born-again Christians running, so it wasn't even like, you know, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, to, to vote for the, uh, uh, the, the the lesser of three evils. It was, it was voting for the, the least of three sinners. Um, and. Um, and so we took a bus, we stayed at the Magic Motel in Hollywood, and every day we would take a bus to uh, the, the, um, Century City, where, where the office of HBO was. 
And there was a sign on the bus that said, uh, warning, uh, there is a, uh, un uh, an undercover uh, um, uh, cop on this bus, you know, to prevent theft. And so I didn't believe that they had one on every bus. So I started to take that sign down, figuring if there was one, he would he would stop me. And, uh, and, and, and well, you know, sometimes you, you, you have a, a, an impulse and, and you follow it before really examining the consequences. <laughs> but, no, but there was no undercover cop on there, except that Rex started to call, stop thief, stop thief. And, um, uh, everybody started looking at me, not knowing, and so I just told everybody in the bus, it's okay, I'm the undercover cop and we need this to put it on another bus. <laughs> you know, as long as you have an excuse, people will accept almost anything. You know, like, like weapons of mass destruction, for example. Uh, so, um, um, okay, let's see. Uh, well, I should read something from uh, Ralph Messer's piece on, 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 on Tobes Live, just a bit of it to give you uh, a, a, a sense of the poetic way in which... Oh, wait, first let me read something about John Lilly, because this is really uh, bizarre. Uh, remembering John Lilly, this, this I wrote, this is in the ketamine section, um, or vitamin K, as they call it. In 1967... A flashback at Starwood. Um, in 1967, while tripping on LSD at the Seaquarium in Miami, I had a delightful non-verbal encounter with one particular dolphin. I would run to my left, and the dolphin would swim in the same direction. Then I would run to my right, stop short, run to my left again, then back to my right, and the dolphin would swim in perfect synchronization. We resembled that scene in the Marx Brothers movie, Duck Soup, where Harpo mimicked Groucho's motions in a non-existent mirror. Um, by the way, I asked the dolphin, what are you always smirking about? The dolphin replied, and I'm willing to concede that this might have been my own acid projection. <laughs> Again, you try to keep an open mind. Um, uh, the dolphin said, if God, if God is evolution, then how do you know he's finished? Obviously, it was a male chauvinist dolphin. Um, in 1970, I attended a workshop conducted by John Lilly, and uh, I asked him about, I told him about that. Um, and uh, uh, and I said that the dolphin said to me, if God is evolution, then how do you know he's finished? And he corrected me. Lily said, no, it's how do you know you're finished? And it was a simple yet profound revelation, and so conscious evolution became the name of the game. Lily considered dolphins to be smarter and more benevolent than humans. His work inspired a movie, The Day of the Dolphin, in 1973, in which the Navy trained dolphins to be underwater weapon carriers. Lily was dismayed. They've turned dolphins into little gray niggers of the sea, he told me. Uh, Lily and his artist wife, Tony, later founded the Human Dolphin Foundation. And in 1980, with computer scientists, he designed a computer system, Janus, to formulate a human dolphin community science language. In 1981, I introduced Lily to freelance writer Sandra Catherine, and she became his, quote, invaluable friend. She kept a journal, sample entry, the rooms have mirrors. Above a bathroom sink, a concave mirror stretches. Walls completely framed with mirrors. Light bounces back and forth between mirrors. I ask, how much light is lost in each reflection? One eighth, replies the scientist. He would know that, or maybe he was putting her on. You know, who knows? You, you know, you can't argue with, with experts because, uh, uh, because they're always wrong. Um, Back in 1960, 1954, Lilly was pondering what effects would occur in the brain if deprived of external stimulation, and he invented the isolation tank where a person could lie suspended, perhaps for hours, in a dark coffin-like enclosure filled with warm salt water. In the 60s, he added the ingestion of LSD to the mix, and a decade later, he began experimenting with ketamine, essentially an anesthetic to enhance the out-of-body experience. Patty Chayefsky wrote a novel, Altered States, based on Lily's isolation tank research, and he also wrote a screenplay, but was so disappointed in at director Ken Russell's film version, released in 1980, that he insisted on, insisted on a pseudonym for his writer's credit. So if you see that, you'll see it's uh, Patty Rumpel Foreskin. Uh, <laughs> Lily adored ketamine. His standard greeting to friends became, got any K? Um, um, and then, uh, let me switch to something that's um, uh, here. Um, Lily, um, 
Uh, uh, one time, Lily, um, oh wait, I want to, I want to, yeah, here it is. Once as a consequence of his experimentation with ketamine, uh, Lily was hospital, 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 hospitalized. His, Tony called and asked me to speak, uh, Tony, his wife, to speak with him, which I did for about an hour. He kept repeating a mysterious sentence. Joe took father's shoe bench out, meet me by the lawn. Uh, I thought that he had gone totally crazy. But he later clarified his utterance, which was a test sentence by the telephone company to test transmission. Uh, transmissions. It was his way of communicating that he was okay. Um, another time, while carrying out his tired affair with ketamine, Lily almost drowned in the hot tub at his Malibu home. This near-death experience confirmed for him that his life, quote, was guarded by higher powers in the extraterrestrial reality a hierarchy of entities operating through the control of coincidence on a global scale. Lily had propounded that concept, calling it the Earth Coincidence Control Office, which struck me as a witty metaphor until I realized that he actually meant it literally. So I decided to act as if I believed in the existence of such a process, and as a result, I began to lose my perspective. I had bought into John Lily's cosmic conspiracy. I had gone over the edge from a universe that didn't know I existed to one that did, from false humility to false pride. A couple of later, de a couple of decades later, Lily would dismiss his own concept. Tooth problems, he explained. I was trying to get in touch with my teeth. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's what I mean about experts, you know. Um, every expert, every leader I've ever met, every countercultural icon, as well, the, well as cultural icon, has had a streak of madness uh, uh, that was the other side of the coin of their streak of genius. And um, so uh, I just tried to remain able to tell the difference between which side of the coin I was playing at a particular time. Um, and here's a good example. A close friend of Lily, known only as Brumbear, told me for over 10 years we were fellow ketomaniacs. Ketum the last time we shot up was a couple of years ago in Hawaii. And already then, it took quite a toll on my body and even, even more on John's. Taking ketamine isn't just a flirt with death. It's a tantric fuck with death, all nine holes of your body participating, and it's not free. I observed John as somebody who was interested in sexual identity, and I once jokingly suggested how it would be if we all had a sex change in the middle of our life, and so would experience both genders. When I heard he wanted breast implants, I was hoping for the, protect, for the protective sanity of his friend. But he wouldn't have been John Lilly genius if he couldn't find somebody to do him the favor. John also wore makeup in those days. The boobs were awful, square and hard. Um, then one day they found John's, this is just pretty disgusting, so you can put your fingers in your ears and I'll let you know when I'm finished. With it. One day they found John minus most of his blood on the bedroom floor. The wound from the implant hadn't healed. Ants were marching around in a wound that John had tried to close with paper clips. In the best, and this is a guy who knows that one eighth of the light was reflected from the mirror. Paper, uh, tried to close the wound with paper clips in the best sense of a pioneer who uses the materials at hand. When I told Tim Leary about this, he cracked up. My God, Broombauer, he said, look at what a bunch of bores we are, trying desperately to pitch ideas to a software company while John is walking around with boobs. <laughs> uh, he continued, I think the breast impl implant story says what John always proclaimed, that you don't know it if you haven't experienced it yourself. And since he regarded his body as some kind of a laboratory measuring device, to get boobs or any other implant wasn't such a big thing for him. Um, um, so he died with his boobs on. <laughs> I've, never, I've never said that before and I'll never say it again. <laughs> um, all right, now let's see, now, now to the toad slime. Yeah, I, I, want, I have to, you know, since it's in the title, and, and to, see, to see what, um, I'll read two, two things. One is um, um, the, o the only, um, uh, well, first I'll, 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 I'll read the, um, Ralph Metzner, homage to the visionary toad. Um, all right, uh, I'll read a couple of sections. I found myself with three friends in a town in Arizona during the rainy season to harvest some of the hallucinogenic exudate of the uh, Colorado River toad. This magnificent amphibian lives now actually mostly in the Sonora Desert, 
spending nine months of the year buried up to two feet down in the moist underground of Mother Earth. Earth. They emerge after the rains. After the rains, well, maybe maybe they will be in the patches of cow shit out here. Uh, they emerge after the rains, which are often very sparse, for an orgy of feeding and copulation, hanging out in grassy terrain near waterways, hopping under street lights at night to catch flying insects, which is where we can't really jump, which is which which is where we found them. Unlike their long-legged cousins, the frogs, toads can't really jump. They just sort of hop around and are easy to catch. Some of the larger specimens barely fit into, onto a grown man's hand, measuring maybe six inches from head to rear and four inches in width. Plus, they seem to be able to expand their girth, puffing up to make themselves even fatter. The weight and feel of them is like that of a smallish plucked chicken, but the body is very soft and yielding, like you don't really feel any bones. The skin is olive green in hue with little bumpy warts, two raised parot parotid glands, one half length and itch, at the neck and smaller glands at the crook of the elbows and groins. We worked in pairs. One of us would pick up a toad holding it gently but firmly from the top with one hand. And then I always wonder why nuns always walk in pairs. The two, you always see none, never a single nun, they're always walking in pairs because they want to catch toads. Uh, <laughs> one of us would pick up a toad holding it gently but firmly from the top with one hand and then squeeze the gland with thumb and forefinger of the other hand so that the milky white slime would squirt or ooze out onto a sheet of plastic or glass held by the other man. The exudate sticks to the glass and is left to dry overnight. It can then be scraped off with a razor blade in the form of little flakes and crumbs, which can then be put in a pipe or vaporizer and smoked. Well, I can see how this could cause a prison riot. <laughs> no wonder how the warden was right. See all those guys. What, are you making a knife there? No, I'm just squeezing a frog. Okay. And then, then he writes in, in italics all the little sections where he's trying to describe what he's feeling during, during the trip. A shattering annihilation, the feeling of being inside a nuclear explosion, being fragmented into countless tiny shards. I felt as though I was being turned inside out, like my innards were extruding through my mouth. My body was rolling on the ground, coiled into a ball, like a Euroborus serpent circle. I opened my eyes momentarily and could see that I was protected by my friends from bumping into things or rolling into the fireplace. Instant reality check. Eyes closed, I was immersed again into the swirling, seething, maelstrom of synesthetic sensations in which all distinctions between inner and outer, self and other, even directions like above and below were obliterated. Animal sounds appeared to be coming from my mouth. There were no feelings of fear, indeed no feelings at all, other than a kind of impersonal ecstasy. No sense of body, no sense of self, no I. Images of decapitation, dismemberment, disembowelment flashed by in rapid... I can hardly wait to try this. <laughs> it flashed by in rapid succession, including an image of being run through the chest with a sword. Yet there was no fear or horror associated with these images. I think that the head of the CIA had that same uh, 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 imagery of, you know, falling on a sword uh, and without the use of mushrooms. Yet there was no fear or horror associated with these images. The following thoughts occurred. Death comes to all, now it's your turn. This is it, determination. Resistance is impossible and pointless besides. It's too late, the annihilation has already happened. As I gradually came back into my body, after 10 minutes in real time, I felt bathed in pure joy and completely at peace with myself. The world, the world and my death. Um, let's see. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, all right, let me read. Uh, the final story in, in, in the book, which is by me, um, this is under the impression of and other hives, and this is uh, smoking mouse turds. <laughs> when my daughter Holly was 11 years old, she decided to come stay with me in San Francisco for a whole year. This was a courageous move for her. A new city, a new school, new friends. Our apartment was halfway up a long steep hill, and in the back was what Holly called our magic garden. State Street was uh, just off the intersection of Castro and Market, the heart of the gay ghetto. The, I suppose I should say the anus of the gay ghetto, uh, to be accurate. Uh, and there was a, it was funny, because Holly said to me as we were walking around here, she said, how come I find it strange to see men walking around holding hands? And, you know, there's no Dr. Spock's book, don't prepare you for these kind of things. So I just said what my intuition was. I said, well, because they don't do it in your neighborhood. 
And she said, oh, and then, uh, you know, that was, that was the, enough uh, of a piece of truth. Uh, and, uh, and it demystified it for her. Um, uh, the street was just off the intersection, and there was a Chinese laundry at the foot of the hill called the Gay Laundrette, which even though it had changed owners several times, always kept that name. There was a clothing store named uh, Does Your Mother Know? Uh, <laughs> a bulletin board announcing an anal awareness and relaxation workshop. And, and gays told jokes about themselves, like, why do the Castro clones all have mustaches? And the answer was, to hide the stretch marks. Um, I met Harvey Milk and watched him develop into the gay equivalent of Martin Luther King. Had former cop Dan White not assassinated him, along with Mayor George Moscone, who as a state senator had been the author of a bill to decriminalize marijuana, Milk himself might have been elected the first gay mayor. Holly's best new friend was Pia Hinkle, whose father Warren was then editor of City Magazine, published by Francis Ford Coppola. It was the film director's brief foray into print journalism. The girls used um, the City Magazine color photocopying machine to reproduce dollar bills. Uh, Holly and Pia enjoyed, enjoyed playing tricks. Once they rolled a marriage, you want to join for me, only they filled it with herbal tea. Actually, I had a healthy stash of pot in my desk drawer, but mice kept getting inside and eating right through the baggie in order to get their cannabis fix. Uh, I would find mouse turds in the box each day. We had no mouse trap, but Holly had an idea. She asked, doesn't the mouse get the munchies after eating the marijuana? So we left on the floor of our kitchen a large paper bag containing a piece of cheese and a lollipop. Sure enough, in the evening, we would hear the mouse rustling inside the paper bag, and I would capture it by closing the top before it could get out. Then we would bring the bag with the stoned mouse out to an empty lot across the street and let it go to go, go free, only to be caught sooner or later by a stray cat, who in, turn, who in turn would get zonked out from having eaten the stoned mouse. <laughs> Although we had literally invented a better mouse trap, a non-violent one at that, the world was not exactly beating a path to our door, as promised by the folklore of the capitalist system. I had been performing stand-up comedy, and naturally that little experience turned into a bit on stage. I would weave an imaginary story about how I had found myself becoming especially stoned on this stash, but I could not figure out what made it so powerful. Then I decided to send a sample to Farm Chem, a sort of People's Food and Drug Administration, and they informed me that a preliminary test showed that there was an unknown additive in my marijuana. They could ascertain only that it was organic, but further testing indicated that it was mouse turds. So I began to entice the mice by leaving marijuana out and capturing them with the old lollipop in the bag ploy. I would collect their turds until I had enough to roll a dynamite joint. <laughs> I had discovered a new and cheap way of getting high, smoking mouse turds. I decided to pre present a comedic equivalent to or Tony Orlando and Dawn. What stand-up comic had ever, had, had ever featured backup singers before? I held an informal rehearsal with Holly and Pia for the debut of Paul Krasner and Dusk. They choreographed their own dance steps to perform behind me, singing the appropriate do ah do ah while I proceeded to tell the tale of my, new dis my discovery of a new way to get high at no expense except for lollipop and rolling papers, culminating with a spectacular musical chant by Dusk, mouse turds, mouse turds, mouse turds, as they rhythmically flailed their arms in the air. At a local No Talent contest sponsored by Rolling Stone, I decided to play my, my musical saw for the first time publicly. As I was putting rosin on my bow, I confessed to the audience, this is slightly humiliating for someone who was a child prodigy violinist, me, the youngest concert artist ever to perform at Carnegie Hall, and when I was only six years old. But, and then, having diligently smoked mouse turds, I surrendered to an impulse. Uh, instead of uh, playing Indian love call on my musical saw, as I had been practicing, I simply sawed my bow in half <laughs> with the saw. The audience was stunned for an instant, then laughed and applauded my bizarre performance. Holly berated me for wasting money like that, and I promised never to do it again. We spent that, oh, here's the story I told before. We spent that Christmas with Ken Kesey at the family barn in Oregon. They all lived in a huge sectioned out barn with a metal, metal fireplace that hung from the living room ceiling. Ken's brother Chuck ran a creamery and he brought over a large supply of homemade ice cream blended with two kinds of liquor. I ate so much, the coldness and sweetness covered up the taste of alcohol, that without even knowing it, for the first time in my life I got drunk on ice cream, throwing up and passing out. Later I explained I never take any legal drugs. Which actually isn't totally true because um, I, I take an aspirin about once a year. 
Uh, but not for a headache or anything, it's just, you know, I'm a, 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 for social reasons. You know, <laughs> party, other people are taking aspirin and kind of join in, you know. It's, just, it's, it's peer pressure, really. Um, what? Did they make mouse um, Not yet. Not yet, no, no, but, um, yes, yes, yeah. You, you, you put it into the air now, into the ether. Um, so, so I'm sorry to say that I had uh, a, a mailed myself a, a box of uh, 20 copies of this book to meet Kara Starwood, and they said at the office that it came in, but nobody knows where it is. My one theory is that somebody who took ecstasy is out in the woods somewhere hugging the box. <laughs> so, um, um, so I'm, I'm sorry I can't sell it here, but if, if, if you want to get it, um, uh, get it online from my website, which is uh, just simply, you don't have to write it down, it's paulkrasner.com, two S's, paulkrasner.com. Uh, if you don't have a computer um, and you want to get it by snail mail, just come up to me and I'll give you my, my home address and you can just do it that way. Because I always resent that you can get bargains on the internet from hotels and, and products and, and airlines. Uh, if you get it on the internet, if you get it through them, uh, because you don't have enough money to buy a computer, then you have to pay more. So uh, sometimes there ain't no justice. So uh, I, I, once again, I thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure, and I wish I did have mushrooms to pay. Actually, they're under your seat by tape. Just check them out. <laughs>